I'm Ken. Um, I've met you before, Karen. I delivered a print to you quite a while ago, but um, I'm a photographer, I uh, guess a set designer, and I dabble in a bit of writing. Um, I've just really, I mean, I don't know. I kind of just love telling stories of my photography. I think <laughs> priority, but I really kind of explore a lot to do with my heritage. A lot of my work stems from an autobiographical standpoint. Um, I love working with different objects and kind of painting with these objects and then photographing them. Um, and I don't know, all of this work has kind of, it's kind of a new thing I would say. I kind of really only went into the still life and art photography and storytelling when lockdown kind of hit. Um, I actually trained as a fashion photographer. So all of this work that I'm currently showing you, a lot of it, I would say maybe 80% has just come from, you know, my personal projects. And um, I'm just gonna kind of go through my work and kind of my process and kind of the journey with that work. So um, I went to uni at LCF and I studied fashion photography. Um, I did it for three years and I guess it went pretty well. I worked with some really cool clients, but I went to fashion week and I kind of just realized I wasn't really in love with it anymore. There was such an aspect of kind of telling stories of your clothing and kind of how that changed your character um, that I did love and I still do love fashion. Um, it's just that it really wasn't kind of the environment or industry that I really gelled with. There were two shoots that I did during my course at uni, which was for my final major project. Um, and they were based on takeaway kids, basically kids who grew up above takeaway shops in London. Um, and their parents basically migrated to London in the 60s. And I, I took these models back to their hometowns and their takeaways and I photographed them as their parents. And that was kind of one project I look back at during that era when I did do fashion photography, which I really thought, you know, that's kind of something that I relate to still and that's something that I kind of want to dive into. Um, but during that time at uni as well, I was still photographing things kind of around me. Um, back in Hong Kong or back in my hometown, which were to do just with storytelling or things that around me that kind of inspired me. I've always been really into art. I was, I, I wanted to train as an artist, but my mum said, you're only gonna make money when you're dead. So she didn't let me do that. I did photography instead. Um, but I just started capturing, you know, people around me and basically stories around me during that time. I think I was like 21 and it was a period where I would randomly meet um, really influential people just at random places. I met um, David Sims outside a barber shop and um, I met Camilla Lofer who used to run CLM and they would just ask me if I wanted to show them my work and I did. Um, and when I showed Ciela my work, she said all oh, my fashion work was very mediocre. And it, you know, she had seen things like that before, but what she hadn't seen were these photographs of my grandmother and these stories that I kind of was dipping in and out of telling. So I kind of came to that decision after a few years of uni, after working in the industry for a while that I was gonna really dive into storytelling and capturing those people. And basically just capturing, you know, things I really wanted to talk about um, and capturing the people that I loved. Um, but I think the biggest change happened was probably during lockdown um, where I was just like, I don't know, I just didn't really like the fashion stuff and I didn't really feel like it related to me. There were photographers that I absolutely admired, like Alexandra Sanguinetti, who works with Magnum, who captured um, her nieces and, you know, there was so much nostalgia and childhood and, you know, they were such dreamlike images that I really related to, to um, Duane Michaels, who captured homosexuality and kind of these different aspects of death and storytelling. And um, Marius Hansen, who 
always shoots for the gourmand um, who was really highly influenced by Irving Penn. And these were photographers who I looked at and I was like, wow, like I love their work. I really want to create work like that for myself. I want to start telling, you know, my own story. Um, and that kind of happened in the summer of 2018 where it was really weird. I feel like that was a year where everything completely changed in my life. Um, I came out to my dad after my mum died and then that led on to a huge family feud. Um, then that led on to just, just this splitting of family and it really opened my eyes to so many things about my heritage and my culture that I really didn't agree on. And um, a lot of the time I feel like in Chinese culture, you don't really say how you feel, you kind of act upon it. So I photographed my coming out. Um, there's an old story called the, cutting, the Passion of the Cut Sleeve where Emperor Han cuts his sleeve off because his lover is asleep. And instead of waking him up, he cuts it off. So I use that story as inspiration of my own coming out. And um, I photographed a portrait of myself basically wearing um, the red wedding banquet attire, which you wear at Chinese wedding. And I cut my own sleeve off and it was, like, it's, it's, it was symbolic and it was kind of referencing that story. It was kind of going, you know, I've come out. Um, I put myself in underwear as well. And I had like tea leaking down my thigh and everything. And it was supposed to be very provocative. It was supposed to be disrespectful. The things my dad said when I came out was like, you know, you're disgusting. Um, you're, you're never gonna be happy. It's an illness you need to change. Um, but the one thing he kept saying was, you're never gonna get married and you're never gonna have a Chinese wedding. So I wanted to photograph that Chinese wedding that you know, I would never have. Um, and that was kind of my first experience of diving into still life, I guess. I photographed all these objects that I'd seen around me in Chinese weddings. And I literally just ripped them apart and kind of played with them. Um, in Chinese art and Western art, there's so much symbolism, which I love, you know. My dad said, you're never gonna have children. So I grabbed objects like pomegranates and quail eggs and dates and sunflower seeds, which you're all supposed to eat during Chinese weddings to promote fertility and babies and chopsticks are supposed to represent, you know, husband and wife. So I snapped one in half and you have to double fish, which is supposed to be double happiness and double luck. And, you know, I threw a condom everywhere and dirty underwear. And it was all supposed to be like this visualization of this conversation that I had with my dad. Um, and I continued the series. I began photographing other people who had come out in China as well. Mel, who was non-binary, who told me that every time they shaved their hair off, um, their parents would kind of explode at them and they would just cry on the bathroom floor. And I visualized that this kind of conversation they had when they did come out in the end and they told me their parents basically dropped what they were doing at this Chinese restaurant. And I visualized this rice bowl just smashing and crashing to the ground. So a lot of these still lives were quite theatrical, but they had a lot of meaning. And that whole project was kind of this weird therapy where I said, I really need to meet more Chinese people who have come out and talk about their experiences. And along the way I met Jay as well who wrote a letter um, to his parents, as well as to the Taiwanese military, because if you tell the Taiwanese military that you're uh, gay, they count it as the mental disability. So you're, you don't have to join national service. So a lot of Taiwanese boys did this, and I created a still life, which kind of told that story. Again, there was a cut sleeve, but I used a crab because crab, symbolized imperialism and military in um, Chinese art. And I literally had this crap like reading this coming out letter. So that was kind of my first dive into still life and art photography. At the time, I didn't really know what it was. I was just kind of buying loads of food from Tesco and like smashing it. And my housemates were like, what the fuck is he doing? Um, but it was a really cool thing to do. And in the end, I actually wrote an article 
and I wrote, um, I interviewed each person I photographed and I published the article and um, it got published in one of Hong Kong's magazines and I gifted the magazine to my dad. And it was almost like me talking in my dad's language as in, I'm not gonna talk to you about being gay or coming out, but I'm gonna show you these photographs and uh, show you, you know, this article, which is almost like a letter. Um, and I think that kind of continued during lockdown. I mean, I had all this spare time and I was like, I really want to start telling stories and talking about stuff that matters to me. Um, my mum was an extremely important part of my figure and she passed away when I was 19. And I feel like I didn't really get to talk about her death, especially with my family. Um, I grew up in a very kind of, I wouldn't say conservative, but they definitely didn't talk about things. I remember when my mum died, my mum had voice recorded a, a voicemail of her voice um, and it was for her mum, my grandma, and it was just saying, I'm fine, I'm just tired, I'm busy at work. And we literally played that voicemail for I think about a year and a half till they actually told my grandma that my mum had passed away. And this isn't, this isn't a rare thing in um, Chinese families. A lot of Chinese families kind of do this thing where, you know, we believe in protecting each other. We don't really talk about these things. And there was so much stuff I couldn't talk about with my family about my mum's passing that I just wanted to talk about. So. I created work about it, you know, when I was um, 19 at uni, I missed my mum so much. So I photographed her objects, you know, I was told to create a jewellery still life in the fashion photography course and I photographed her objects, her smell, um, what she looked like. Um, and it kind of like leaked into further on into my practice during lockdown. I photographed um, this series called Dinner with Mother Lamb, and it was kind of still lives depicting dinner scenes that I never had with my mum. This was called her 50s, and it was this is called chemotherapy. So, you know, you've got her medication, Bible scriptures, her will laid out. Um, it's shot, you know, during dusk. So it's kind of like autumnal at the ending of things. I shot her forties where she ran a Chinese restaurant and I always remembered, you know, these big staff meals downstairs and kind of joining in and the table would be littered. And, you know, I wanted to litter the table with her jewels and her watch, you know, after a busy day at work to her twenties when she kind of, you know, um, traveled around Europe and she was just kind of having this really fun time and like writing letters back home. And, I don't know, it was really kind of like this weird therapeutic thing where it was like, I would love nothing more to have dinner with my mum, but I can't. So I want to photograph, you know, these moments with her. Um, I never did photograph her when she was alive because I don't know, I guess I was scared when she was sick, but also I wasn't really a photographer back then. So it's been a continuation. Um, these two portraits I shot this year and it was for a magazine in New York called Plus Magazine um, and I photographed the right portrait of me which is called Running to Mum's Grave and I remember at the time when you know I was just a kid I would run to her grave and I'd be crying and you know it was this ritual I had to just visit her um, for bouquet of flowers that I'd pick up at Tesco's um, and then to the left was this portrait of me dressed up as my mum. And I purposely wore her clothes and did makeup like her and supposed to almost be like, the portrait's called I Am Mother Lamb. And it was all about this realization that, you know, no one can really be a mum to me. I have to be a mum to myself. But, you know, by putting makeup and wearing a dress, it was kind of almost saying fuck you to all of the uh, ideals of my family or my culture about what being a man is and, um, you know, masculinity or whatever. Um, I think there's so much, not anger, but I guess things I don't agree with, with my culture or my family. I don't agree that, you know, women should be second. I don't agree that, you know, 
being called a girl or a woman means that you're second to a man. So I did this on purpose. I would say a lot of my work, my personal work especially, is quite, it's almost provoking my family's beliefs, um, which is why none of them talk to me anymore. <laughs> um, but I also did all these still lives as well. This was for Far Near in New York. Um, and they're a really cool magazine. They kind of celebrate Asian and Southeast Asian artists. and. This was called um, Mother Lamb's Funeral. And my mum never had a Chinese funeral because she was a Christian. And I always wondered what her Chinese funeral was. She was the year of the rooster. So I got a dead chicken or a rooster. And um, I photographed it. And again, you know, I used all these objects again, like this egg that's hatched and blossoming flowers to the Chinese wine that you pour during a funeral, to the candle that's being blown out. You know, it's a reference to old Fanny Tass still life paintings with death and everything. And I kind of just love that. I really do love adding these little bits of um, symbolism into my work um, that are kind of like conversations. So, yeah, and that series actually continued. I photographed things, more things about um, the culture or my heritage, this is called A Broken Marriage. And it's about how a lot of young girls were in these arranged marriages and they didn't really work out and the wedding jade bracelet just breaks apart. Um, and this was such a fun series to take. I mean, it was literally like, I was in Hong Kong for three months looking after my grandma. And I remember going to the wet market with my aunt and I would buy all of this food and she'd always be like, what the fuck are you doing for this food? And I'd be like, I'm gonna create a photo series. But I'd always have till five o'clock to finish it because that was when my aunt and my grandma would take all the food and actually cook it. Um, so yeah, I, I took all these objects around. This is called Breaking Traditions and it was about my dad's prized uh, porcelain antiques and it's basically a representation of you know there's noodles spilled over it there's a dead squid it was kind of like about breaking those traditions and kind of like taking away the value of these you know traditions and making them something new and I wrote all these short stories with them as well um, and I think you know these images kind of when someone asked me what type of images do you like taking? These are the type of images I like taking where I pick up these random objects and I kind of just go for it. Um, life and death of a fish, um, which was talking all about life and death in Chinese culture. Um, I bought a goldfish, which we rehomed later and then we ate that sea bass. But yeah, this was all literally just shot in my dad's living room. Um, just by the window. And I think that's what I kind of, I still love doing, even if it's for a big client. I don't like having a huge team or a huge set. I like to keep it very intimate and I kind of just have a playlist playing. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about these projects that I did before the clients came in. And it's something I kind of learned, I guess, from watching my mom work at a Chinese restaurant which is this business technique where she would do so much for free um, to kind of promote her business. And she would be like, the customers will come back soon or come later. Um, and, and that's kind of what I did with fashion as well. I did so many editorials and personal projects um, just for myself. And I knew that this would get people, you know, watching and then I actually did land those clients. So, um, yeah, there were these projects that I did who, they weren't for anyone. They were literally for me, but I, you know, I was like, I'm gonna publish them eventually. This was called um, The End of an Era. And it was took, it was taken last year when I visited my grandma and I was like, this is probably gonna be the last time I'm gonna visit her after this ritual of mine where I visit her maybe once or twice a year. And there are so many magazines I look at and I love, you know, like Luncheon, Gourmand. And I was like, I want to capture the essence of this person. I want to capture the essence of this village that I've grown up in, that the Lamb family have grown up in. So I caught that, you know, and I caught things like her Tupperware and her um, sippy cup and 
you know, arranging them into faces because my grandma is 97 and she's literally like a baby, you know? So I wrapped her in this big duvet and shot her portrait, shot her like feet that are crooked and covered in dead skin because I'd have to moisturize them every night with her. And um, it was all about capturing these characters in my family. Um, and I wanted to turn them almost into the models that I used to photograph when I was at uni. And because they were so fun, you know, these weren't just models from agencies. This was my aunt who would take me to the wet market every morning and we'd have these big shopping bags and we'd have to carry them back, who really contrasted to my other aunt, who was a multi-millionaire um, logistics company owner, who would always steal me from the shopping aunt and go, do you want to go shopping with me? I'll take you to a designer warehouse, I'm going to buy you all these clothes, you know. And I just wanted to capture the different characters in the village. I captured my dad with his girlfriend, um, which was really me kind of saying to my dad, like, hey dad, like I accept that you've got a girlfriend and she lives with you. Um, and, you know, all of these portraits were really kind of depictions of this whole journey I've had in my grandma's village and this whole story that I've had with her since being a kid, you know. I have spent countless afternoons just like sitting with her and just doing absolutely nothing, just being bored with her. And um, every time I'd get too bored, I would always say to her that I've got work and, it would, and my work would start at seven o'clock and I would get dressed up and go into the city and get absolutely wasted with friends and then take the last bus home or arrive at 6 a.m. and she'd always find me. But I would always tell my grandma that I was going off for work and she'd think I was a businessman. So I photographed myself as this Chinese businessman on the right. Um, and I just captured like the beauty of this village that I knew was going to get knocked down as soon as she passed away because she was one of the last residents. And um, it kind of just continued. That shoot I just showed you, End of the Era, was published in Broad Magazine in Canada. That's a really, it's a really beautiful uh, photography magazine. Whilst the Every Day of Grandma Lamb, which is what I'm showing you, was shot, I think, about two years prior and it was all depictions of just my grandma and her, you know, living her every single day life and kind of just being bored. Um, I love this thing where I do with my work is I always photograph it as if it's going to end up in a magazine or a book. And I always think what picture is going to talk with this other picture. I like to imagine these two photographs having a conversation, you know like the glove that's all like scratchy and itchy that she uses to burn her ancestral papers with her like watery old hand um, to the dinners that she's eating um, to all of this stuff around her village which is just decaying but it also looks really beautiful um, to like her old sagging watery ear that looks like a piece of meat that you'd find in the wet market um, and I kind of just that's something that I love doing I love kind of taking a picture and placing it next to another photo and you know letting them both talk and letting the audience kind of you know feel something that was published with Fat Boy Zine with Anten Books and um, I started publishing all this stuff on my Instagram and started getting a bit of a following and clients kind of soon follow um, Fat Boy Zine with Anten Books, I absolutely love them. They've always kind of believed in my work and they asked me to sh write three stories. The first one is called, I used to sit on eggs when I was a child. And it was a depiction of um, Nine One Bao, which is like a custard bao, but also like a depiction of this story of when I was a kid, I used to sit on eggs as a as a child and I used to really hope they would hatch. Um, and these still lives, when I look at them, you know, they're from places of nostalgia and childhood and they're really fun, but I do want to photograph them as if they look like pieces of art or they look like they belong in these magazines that I really want to work with. Um, this is called Big Dumpling Energy. Um, and I just wanted to make this dumpling look like an extravagant thing you'd have at Michelin star restaurant. But I also wanted to litter it with 
you know, objects that I see at home, which are quite not, I guess, quite crass, you know, like the old peelings of watermelon to the monkey peanuts that you have at dinner. Um, I, I love to talk about things like class and, you know, politics or just social things in my work, but in a very kind of light way, I guess. Um, and it's, it's done through objects. This was called Spring Soup, and it was for a recipe for chicken and lemongrass soup, and I wanted to talk about the seasons. Um, yeah, and I don't know, I just absolutely love shooting stuff like this. I don't even think it's work. Like, if someone tells me to gather all these objects up and place them in the manner, I just go, yeah, go for it. Um, and it, this work, has actually followed through with some clients that I'm really happy about. I shot for Financial Times, I think about three weeks ago, and it made the cover. And it's so funny, this pear picture actually is, it was, Financial Times got in contact with me because they saw this print that I actually uh, sold to Karen. And it's of a pomelo and an orange, and it's my grandma's, um, it's my grandma's, like praying, she basically offers it and she prays um, fruit. And I shot that when I was, I think like 19. So I think like seven years later, you know, a big client like Financial Times sees that picture and then they hire me to do something. And they said to me, can you shoot something similar, but your theme is pears, it's the renaissance of pears. And yeah, I just went crazy. I was just like, <laughs> grabbed a shit ton of pears and fruit. Um, and it was so much fun, honestly. Like, I just, I loved just going through like markets and like, you know, calling people up and looking for like these flowers and pollen. And it was just such a joy to shoot. And it's weird, it's like this type of work has kind of continued. I think like I go from photographing my grandma's dinner to photographing like Pagoit watches and, and the Beers Jewelers for Hong Kong and having that same feeling as I did with dinner with Mother Lamb, where, you know, it's the end of a dinner setting, but this time I'm photographing 500,000 pounds worth of jewelry um, just in my living room with three security guards. And it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just really, cool I guess I don't really see it as work um when I do create these still lives though like I do gather a lot of objects but I think I also think quite geometrically I love having these lines that are created by cloths and you know it's almost I remember I watched the Tracy Emin clip where she talked about the bed and she compared it to William Turner's like waves and it does make your eye travel it's I almost look at fabric as liquid in a still life and I look at, you know, chopsticks or a knife or that pen as these like strong lines that are cutting across, you know, these circular plates. And you'll see in a lot of my still lives that there are always plates and fabrics because when I break it down, it's actually the shapes that are kind of balancing. Um, one of the last clients I kind of always work with is Wham London. I photographed this series and it was called Incubation and it was all about lockdown and you know these scenes in domestic settings and kind of the outside world exploding into them. Um, you had scenes of you know on the left of someone being bored and I think those are a box of pills of Benadol tablets that you take for anxiety so it was like a little nod to people's struggle with mental health whilst on the right you know you have daisies kind of blooming out of um, a phone and it was all this quite romantic thing, a romantic nod to, you know, hearing someone's voice and feeling okay. And they were one of the first clients that really kind of let me go crazy with my uh, set design, which I absolutely love doing. Um, and yeah, I don't know, the last thing I was going to talk about is just my process. And it's honestly quite simple, I think. I don't know, with Financial Times, they gave me like five words, Renaissance, pears, autumn, brown, warmth. <laughs> and um, I just kind of pitched, you know, my ideas like pollination and flowers and like something blooming and going crazy. And I really wanted a dove in there as well for some reason. Um, and when I, you know, kind of build these little um, treatments, I, I kind of 
reference a lot of the art that does inspire me or other photographers. And it goes from like sketch to the final product. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I've got done for you guys, really. Thank you so much, Ken. That was so good. Really enjoyed that. Yeah, it was great. That was really great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I never went to talk where I laughed and cried at the same time. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, no, your that your work, yeah, that was I think I think we all felt very extremely touched by that, very warm as well. I looked at your work previously from this because I've never seen your work before and on screen it, it, it was very interesting like looking at your 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 work and it's, it's kind of like where it's kind of like a little a little chaos that's happening but as you was telling us the story it was it was really quite beautiful actually it really really was um yeah it's, it, it, as soon as you hear the narrative behind it it makes your work just look so i don't know yeah just it's lovely it's so warm but a question i'll get to my question now um, and it's basically um about your textures um i really like you use do you, do you sort of like every time you shoot do you sort of aim to to bring in as many and a lot of different textures from water based to like hard to solid to fabrics. Is that like a, a focus of yours? And is there any sort of more textures you can't, and materials that you kind of want to sort of play around with? Or is it all just going off sort of what you feel is necessary uh, regarding the topic? Um, I think, I don't know, when I was about 20 I showed this movement director who was working for Vogue who I also just randomly met on the street and he was like I love your textures and I, I really did really understand what he meant by that and he was like you can feel and smell you know your photographs and I looked at them and I was like oh yeah you're right so ever since that conversation I've really got yeah I want these still lives to literally act like, you know, um, they're just full of textures. As in whether it's kind of like movement from like a smudge or like a spill to something like hard. But yeah, you're right. I, I do kind of always like adding those contrasts of like hard and soft. And um, I don't know, there's not much other textures I haven't used. I used fire once. Um, but my dad was like, what the fuck are you burning in the living room? <laughs> so I didn't get to complete that shoot. But um, yeah, really, I'm, I haven't reached that stage where, you know, I would have a lot of assistances to kind of help me like build a fire or build these things. I guess when the clients get bigger or the projects get bigger, you know, I can start kind of going a little bit more wild with what I use. Question. Yeah, when you um, work on like a still life, you in your process plan ahead. Well, obviously, you have a, a level of planning where you know kind of like what symbols or what items you want to bring in. But is this more of a thing where you like to plan everything beforehand and go hunt for the objects, or is it the thing where? You have a vague idea what you want to do, and then you try, and then you're like, oh, I really miss, like, I'm really missing a blue transparent glass, and then hunt for it for ages. Like, oh, how does that work in terms of your process with the still lives? I think there's been times where I've planned a still life and I've like drawn pictures, and the picture never appears in the photograph. Um, like the one with the dead rooster, I literally just drew a chicken on a page with like dead eyes and I was like, cool, that's planning done. But there's key things, you know, like I go, I want that to be really red and I want this and I want that. I think the shoot that I did with um, Fat Boy Z, the one towards the end, the big dumpling, I was like, oh my God, I really want an oyster because I saw that Irving Penn did this oyster still life that I loved and I wanted to just insert that in to add a bit of luxury and we didn't have oysters so that was like a instance where I kind of just had to run to Broadway market to buy an oyster and that was it but most of the time I can't 
plan meticulously because it's almost like I come to set and I have this faint idea and it just starts happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it never looks like what I have planned. So really all I do for planning is just have a few visual references and maybe a little sketch, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a very organic process when I'm actually building stuff. Okay. I'll go. Um, I guess, yeah, Ken, I feel super personal, like looking at your work, because coming from a similar background, um, I, I have two questions. So one is, obviously, from your presentation, I've seen that throughout lockdown, then might be something that inspired you to do the work that you're doing at the moment. Whereas a lot of creative are super blocked and they don't know, you know, like how to how to proceed with their work. Um, where do you find inspiration? How do you yeah? How to do that? Um, I think I was really sad during lockdown. <laughs> I think I was like, oh fucking hell like there's so much like shit going on and it was kind of like this I think the same with everyone there was so much like um stuff coming up so I just I literally was like okay I feel like shit or there's a lot of grief or there's a lot of anger and I you know I liked um what your colleague said about there's quite a lot of chaos because I'm not a really chaotic person but I guess when I do create that work, I can be chaotic, I can be violent, I can smash these things. So I guess my inspiration was really everything I couldn't talk about. And it was everything that I wanted to talk about or I wanted to release. Um, and it became such a visual outlet, as in, you know, I, I couldn't call up my dad and tell him all these things about my mum and everything so I photographed it or you know there's so many series that I haven't put in this presentation which were literally just personal projects that I did but it's funny when I look back at those personal projects and I look at something a client has told me to do and they end up being almost very similar or you know um it's like the pear shoot isn't an emotional shoot but the fabrics and you know all these things spilling out and all these things blooming reference a lot of the work that I did do during lockdown so yeah it's just for creatives who are stuck I just say get sad get really sad <laughs> <laughs> do you find it harder to approach a client project when you're happy <laughs> not at all um I'm really glad <laughs> I think it's been like a really organic thing where I hate sending cold emails or networking. I'm really shit at that. But I think I always believe if, you know, my work is strong enough and it's good enough, those people are going to come towards me. And, you know, that has actually happened. Um, yeah, and I would actually like to correct it. It's not actually always photographing things that are, you know you're sad about it's things that you know are really important to you like the series that I did with my grandma going back home it was such a joyous shoot to do and mm. it was more of an act of capturing you know things around me that I knew were gonna you know leave one day or you know it was a moment in time that I wanted to keep hold of so yeah it's not like all tears some of it's you know just me capturing beautiful things around me so yeah yeah i think that's one thing that's so like nice about both your personal projects and your client work is that it just still feels so authentic and i think maybe authentic is more the right word rather than sound <laughs> is that right? like it, just, it just feels like really authentic which i think it's so obvious. Like it's so obvious when we look at I mean trust me, for me, but when I look at your work I find it so obvious that it's so authentic and it's so nice because I feel like sometimes it's try like people try too hard and that's fine, that's the thing in itself. But I think that's beautiful about your work that's so like yeah. yeah. I don't know, I have no other words than authentic. Yeah. You know yeah. I, mean? yeah. <laughs> I think like my my friend once said to me that like honesty is really sexy, so 
I tried to be a bit like more honest with my work as in I really try not to look at other people's work too much or because then I find myself copying what they do or you know when I arrive on set I just go no you're doing what you've always done which is you know turn up with a bag full of random objects and you're just gonna place them around and you know every time I get nervous on a big shoot I just I literally just imagine I'm back at my grandma's living room you know falling around with her ingredients and creating these you know images um and I, I really don't want to let that go as in I feel I don't want what happened when I started shooting fashion which is when I tried to become a different type of uh, photographer to happen again I just kind of want to shoot stuff for me and continue with this style hopefully yeah another question anyone else I've got one more um do you have like a do you have a dream client that you would like to sort of work with because if you're saying you're only starting to get the clients and whatnot but do you have like one or two that you would love to sort of pick um, apart do, um I've got, I think I've got a few. I think I would love to shoot for luncheon or gourmand or there are a few wow. chefs or, I, don't know. I think honestly, if I ever had an exhibition, I would just cry. <laughs> I don't know, it's weird. Like even this year, there's been some really big clients. Um, um, you know when you just have to like play it really cool but inside you're kind of just freaking out um <laughs> many times so yeah hopefully it will happen i mean like i even think this is such an honor for you guys to ask me to talk about my work and when i checked you guys out and my friends you know see what you guys do i was like wow you know so i'm always very grateful for who i managed to work with because it it does sometimes still feel that i'm just um fooling around with objects and just taking random photographs you know but now it's not it um you know business being the financial times and i don't even know how to do my tax return yet so but <laughs> i find it i still find it all very funny but really cool at the same time yeah yeah. Before, uh, sorry. Go to, yeah. Before uh, you had all these big clients, I suppose, coming to you, how, how did you do with work? Like, did you ever have to almost like do so less work? Or did you always spend your ground and be like, no, I'd rather have like a, a full job than keep doing my personal work? Like, do you know what I mean? I don't know how to phrase my question. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I've never had like a full time job, which all my friends laugh at about me. But um, I've always had those freelance jobs, um, you know, on the side of shooting all those personal projects. I was still photographing for lots of modeling agencies and kind of work with restaurants. You know, right now I still work at a, you know, coffee shop, bookshop which sells queer literature. But I always say, uh, I find it really important for me to kind of have that side job, which has nothing to do with my actual work, just because, I don't know, it just gives me a break. And it's kind of like, uh, it, it, I don't ever want to take my work too seriously, if you know what I mean. Because I think when I start doing that, it's going to start, being authentic so you know working I used to be front of house at the photographer's gallery or um, you know now I just make coffee and stuff and I think it's just it's just fun and I, I, I don't know I always say I'm still really really young and I don't want to put too much pressure on myself and if that means having a part-time job to pay the bills I'm gonna do it you know um, so yeah, I just, I'm gonna continue doing it till I guess I become a really evil, angry, big photographer. Okay. But yeah. Yeah, so that's to meet someone that was that. Like, 
the UK especially. It's yeah. not that spread, whereas I'm from somewhere in Europe. <laughs> Doesn't matter <laughs> where. I'm living in places and like it's so much more recognized as like a normal way of living. That kind of like food job and then your practice on the side. Mm -hmm. I feel like here in the UK, it's like almost not like a thing, which is that's why I'm saying it's nice to hear that. Like, yeah, I don't know. We this really beautiful kind of feeling. Um, not ashamed, but you know, they don't like telling people that they are doing these jobs with hospitality or like you know, a bookshop or coffee shop. When you know, I've worked in hospitality, and that's how I met so many of the clients that I'm working with right now. And you know, I, as I said, these clients were actually just made by genuine connections. And um, yeah. I think that type of job where, you know, you're working really hard, but around, you know, food or something that you love, it's a great time to kind of build character or meet people and just not be a dickhead when you arrive on set, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. That's great. Um, any more questions from our side? I think it's quite a good time to wrap up, maybe. But we really enjoyed. Yeah, thank you so much. much. Thank you. Today. Thank you so much, Ken. No worries. It's weird because um, now I feel like you're my friend because you said so much about yourself.